Mm. I'm tired. Are you tired? You're tired. What are we tired of? Trouble. Luckily, you came to the right place. My name isn't Tired, it's actually Kyle and a friend named Chuck who's gonna help us get out of trouble. He's not gonna help things get back to normal, per se, but he is gonna help us get back to better. Mike Tyson is famous for saying everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Well, over the next few minutes, I wanna help you learn how to hear God's voice when you get punched in the mouth. If you've ever struggled with how to respond to things that don't go as planned, I've got something to say to you today. But let me back up and ask a couple of questions. First, what do you think God's voice even sounds like? I mean, is it an old person's voice? Maybe an agitated politician taking questions from the media? Do you even think hearing God's voice is possible? See, I'm not sure what your church background is, if you even have a church background, but on a normal Sunday, you in a church, you might hear some cliches from a guy in a suit, witness some angry person complaining about Gen Z on stage, or even some young guy in tight jeans stretching metaphors. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all about tweetable phrases. I'm super confused about Gen Z, even though I'm parenting three of them. And I love a great metaphor as much as the next pastor. And after COVID, all my genes are a bit tight fitting. But today is gonna be different. Today, we're gonna try to hear God's voice and what it can mean for you and me when we face trouble. This series, in a nutshell, is about the fact that we all wanna go back to normal, especially after what we've experienced over the last 20 months, 2020 and 2021. But back to normal is easy, and it's not necessarily growth. And what God wants is to help you and I get back to better. But if we want better, we have to give up the illusion of an easy path and embrace the certainty of trouble. Now, when I talk about trouble, I'm defining trouble this way. Trouble is tension. You got any places of tension in your life right now? Trouble is what happens when you face trauma. And I know that I'm talking to people, some of whom are experiencing trauma or have experienced trauma through loss or other things over this period of time. And trouble is what happens whenever you're in a transition. You know, I think about trouble and I think about turbulence on an airplane. Like everything with the pandemic, flying shut down. So it's only been recently that I have been getting back on planes. I don't know if the pilots are out of practice or I'm just more afraid, but I feel like I've had more turbulence on the planes I've been on recently than ever before. And you know, the thing about turbulence is when you're shaking in the middle of the air in an object, all you think about is the fact that this is gonna go down, this plane is gonna go down. And so I don't know if you're like me, but I had to do the research. I had to like help myself with this. And I don't know if you know this, but over the last four decades, there's only one plane crash that can be caused or pointed to turbulence as the cause. Ooh, that might've been a little harsh. Hey, if you're a pilot, I'm sorry. I'm really thankful for what you do every day. So the truth is turbulence is normal. Turbulence is what happens when you get on a plane. And see, we're gonna talk about how the turbulence in our life, the trouble in our life is also normal. You know, I believe every promise in the Bible, I believe every word that Jesus said, including this one in John 16, where Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. That's right, it's a promise from Jesus, trouble is coming. But what if trouble is actually the most certain sign that you're headed in the right direction or that you're going somewhere? See, planes on the tarmac don't experience turbulence. But they also don't get you anywhere. The big idea today is that the way back to better isn't escaping trouble, it's facing trouble. In the Bible, every hero faces trouble. And today we're gonna to talk about a Bible hero named Elijah who has what I would call a classic hero's journey. You might be familiar with this concept. Joseph Campbell kind of brought this to the fore. Every hero's journey, every great story, every great book, your favorite book, your favorite movie follows the same arc where the hero receives a call. And they have to make a decision. Will I, will I stay in my normal or will I move toward better? And what happens after they answer that call? Trouble happens. You know what the best storylines of every movie are? Tension, trauma, transition, repeat. Tension, trauma, transition, repeat. That's exactly what we love about great stories. And we especially love it when the hero finally makes that triumphant return, when they come back better. We love that part. Who doesn't love a good ending to the story? If we're honest, we actually love the trouble in the story too. It's what keeps us engaged. We love trouble in a story, just not in our story. And Elijah is no different than us. Elijah is what's called a prophet. And his story shows up in the book of 1 Kings in the Old Testament of the Bible. His call, 
is to stand alone as a true prophet of God in a time where most of the people around him are not following God. They're following other gods, other idols, false gods. And he's called to kind of stand in that place and be a voice for God to the people. And he has all of these incredible things that happen throughout his life. But his kind of culminating moment, his literal mountaintop experience happens on this mountain called Mount Carmel, where it's a showdown between the 450 prophets who don't follow God and Elijah, who's standing alone. And basically they said, all right, whoever really has the through line to God will be able to have God send down rain or send down fire to burn up this sacrifice. They had set up competing altars. And the 450 prophets, no luck. They're cutting themselves. They're doing all kinds of crazy things, but nothing is happening. And then Elijah prays and God sends down fire and it burns up the altar. It burns up the sacrifice. Ah, fire. It is very clear. He is following the true God. And you would think after that kind of victory that the people would take Elijah and they would put him on their shoulders and they'd be parading him around as the hero that he is. But no, his mountaintop experience is followed by trouble. When in 1 Kings 19.2, right after this, the queen Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also. I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So this is a straight up death threat. And not a death threat from an average Joe. This is a death threat from the queen, from the second most powerful person in the kingdom of Israel. Elijah finds himself in what I would call a trouble trifecta. He's got tension. He's got the tension of a very real death threat. Within 24 hours, she said, you will be dead. And then he probably has the trauma of saying, I just did this thing for God, for the true God. God, where are you now? And that leads him to his transition when in 1 Kings 19, 3 through 4, it says, then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life. He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die. Now, before we judge him too harshly, we've all been there. Think about it. Everything he thought was constant in his life just got upended. Everything he thought was steady is now unsteady. But what happens next is that God meets him in his trouble, and he meets him there in a personal and a powerful way. And I believe that how God responds to Elijah when he faces trouble is helpful for you and I when we face trouble. We're gonna get back to Chuck in just a minute. But first, the role of the church is not just content like this. It's actually to help people who are hurting. Now we do that in two ways at Crossroads. One, we respond when a need comes up, even if it's not in the budget. This week we're doing that by giving $25,000 to help with Hurricane Ida relief in Louisiana. Second, we develop long-term partnerships with world changers all over the place. We're also giving $50,000 more to support our partners in Haiti who are working on the Restavik Foundation. How does this stuff happen? It happens because of normal, regular people like you and like me who respond to God's call to be generous with what He's given us. If you want to join that team, you can go to crossroads.net slash give. And if you're one of our generous givers, here's more on our work in Haiti. Eight hundred thirty-eight miles off the coast of the U.S. is the beautiful and broken country of Haiti. Haiti is the poorest country in our hemisphere, and it's home to a culturally accepted child slavery practice called Restavec. Restavec is when a poorer family sends their child to live with another family and promise of caring, clothing, feeding, and educating the child. Heartbreakingly, this is not the reality these children become household servants denied basic care and education and affection. They live a life of forced labor and frequent beatings. Restavec is a form of human trafficking. They believe that their child is going to go to school. They believe their child is going to be fed and taken care of. But typically, the child ends up being a household slave. These children get up before anybody else in the morning and they start the coffee or they build the fire. Um, they go get the firewood or whatever they need to build the fire. They 
wash the dishes. They might get the kids up for school. They could carry the kids to school. They come home, they make the beds, they clean the house, they sweep the floor, they sweep the yard, they do the laundry, and that's what they use as a child to go and get the water every day. I sometimes go to bed like around 11 or 10, and then I have to wake up at 4 because I have to clean the house before I go to school. Because I remember my happy place was only when I was at school. But when I get home, it was like I am exist, but I'm not living. Yeah, I want them to understand that people, the kids who's in the rest of it, they feel like they exist, but they are not living because that's not life. We've been going to Crossroads since Crossroads was in Clark Montessori. So Crossroads is our family. It's our community. The reality is that we're a reflection of what Crossroads teaches. Crossroads is about doing things. It's about reflecting what you're learning about a relationship with God and learning how to put that to action in the world. So when I see the confidence that these children begin to have just because someone loves them, someone cares for them, it changes them. And seeing these women in the literacy programs, once they learn to read and write, it gives them dignity. For us to think we do not have a role to play in helping Haiti, improve itself and do better is, is just a mistake. The foundation, they are doing like a great job because those kids, they don't really like have somebody to listen to them. And that's what we're hoping to change is that people begin thinking of these children as human, but they begin to see them as human. Coming here, I have people that tell me I'm beautiful. I'm smart, I'm powerful, like I can be everything. Restavec Freedom is infusing change and hope in the lives of these children and in the communities of Haiti. Together we can end child slavery in Haiti in our lifetime. So this story of Elijah just kept popping up for me starting around the end of June. When I was reading my devotional, I'd see it there and it was just kind of taking me on this journey of understanding how God met Elijah at this point in his life where he's facing trouble. Little did I know, a month later, trouble would visit me. Now to understand the trouble that I experienced this summer, you have to, I gotta take you back to 2018 to something that Crossroads did called the Journey to Phantom Lake. And I was a part of it. It was an off-road motorcycle reality show experience. And after eight days of all this hard riding, we are right at the pinnacle of the final destination, this lake on a hilltop on the top of a place in Wyoming called Phantom Lake. And I am doing some of the best motorcycle riding I've ever done in my life when my bike falls. And it falls on me and I break my foot. All right, are you injured? Yeah, I'm injured. Okay. We need Matt. Mango went down and hurt his foot. Oh, man. I Can we just not show that again? I. It still kind of gives me the, the heebie-jeebies to see that. That's important, though, for where we're going, because I was kind of thinking about that, even when I was on that plane in Montana, kind of landing, experiencing a lot of turbulence, landing on the mountains. And I was like, man, you know, I'm a little bit afraid of that, but that's not gonna happen again, right? So I'm there with my son, and we're with an incredible group of men, and it's the first day. And we're doing this leisurely, casual hike. I mean, that, later that week, we're gonna do some higher hikes. We were gonna do some whitewater rafting, and so we're doing this leisurely hike. And, you know, Nathan was, when he got off the plane, his ears were kind of like still clogged up. It's kind of giving him a little bit of pain. We're about an hour into the hike, and I am, you know, just trying to be a good dad. So I remember that his ears are kind of hurting him, and I said, hey, Nathan. And as soon as I say, hey, Nathan, the ground that I was standing on, I was about 12 to 15 feet. There was like a cliff down to this bare riverbed. Let the, 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 the ground just went from under me and I am like rolling, tumbling down this cliff. I fell 12 to 15 feet down this cliff. I land on my back. And my first thought is like, I'm going to be paralyzed. What just happened to me? I'm going to be paralyzed. And so I literally, I get up and I realize, okay, I, I must not be injured in my spine. My arm is starting to kind of feel something. And I am sitting down on that river. 
I can't even describe it. I was beside myself with anger. But it wasn't just anger. It was like shame. It was like, really, God? Like, really? Really? This is happening again to me? Yeah. Chuck Mingo gets angry. In fact, one of the things that I find to be helpful is just processing. Like, just being honest with God when I go through trouble about how I'm really feeling. And so not in that moment, but the next day, um, I, I got a chance to journal about this experience. Because an hour later, after walking back through the woods, I found out that I had broken, fractured radio head on my elbow. And here I am, first day of our trip to Montana, now in a cast on my left arm. And I just want to share a little bit about what I journaled the next day when I was processing this with God, because I think it'll help you understand where I was at emotionally. I said, God, one of my fears about this trip is me getting hurt. Perhaps my greatest fear in life is falling off a cliff. God, as I sat there right after the fall, I was so angry. And I felt abandoned, ashamed, hurt, and confused. Why do I keep getting injured? Why me? Why on day one of what is supposed to be an easy hike? Why on day one of what is supposed to be a father and son bonding experience? And I still have those questions this morning. That fall traumatized me. I am not okay. I feel forgotten, overlooked, not cared for. I feel alone, even among a great group of people. I said to God, I need you to father me. And I need you badly. Because in that moment, I was wrestling with what do I really believe about God in the midst of trouble? How, how can I relate to a God who at this moment I feel has abandoned me? And once again, <clears throat> I am in this situation of failure and pain and trouble and tension and trauma. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go next. And you know, it's at that point that I recognize this is, this is beyond me. This is beyond me. I need God's help. And so interestingly, God starts to bring back this story of Elijah. He starts to bring it back, not in the moment, not immediately, but over the course of the next couple of days, I recognized that what I'd been reading about was actually maybe helpful for what I was about to go through. And I found some lessons, three lessons from his trouble trifecta that as I think about what happened from the point of that fall until today, have been a part of my journey of healing and actually making sense of what happened. Three things. First, when things are unsteady, God is steady with his provision. I love that the first thing God does is as Elijah is in this place in the desert where he is ready to end his life or ready to have his life end, he is struggling in this moment. And I love what God does for him here. The first thing God does is meets his basic needs. God allows him to sleep. An angel comes and after he's woken up from his sleep, the angel gives him bread and water. God meets his basic needs. And I feel like sometimes God does the same for us, that in the times when we want to scream out and feel like God isn't with us, there are some basic needs that God begins to meet. I love that God is just steady with his provision. In the scripture, it talks about, it says, he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and he drank and he lay down again. But God also meets his needs that are a bit more complicated, his need for connection, and no, he's not alone, his need to experience God's presence. And this is a part of the story that if you've read this before in the Bible, you may be familiar with it, that Elijah shows up in this cave. He finds a cave to kind of hunker down in, and God is going to meet him there. And it says a big earthquake comes, and you would think that maybe God's powerful voice speaks and booms through the earthquake, but God is not in the earthquake. And then a fire comes, and in the midst of this fire, it's a powerful thing. You would think God is going to speak out of the fire. He did on the mountaintop, but no, God is not in the fire. It says that after the earthquake and after the fire, God shows up in the sound of a low whisper. You might have heard it as a gentle, quiet breeze. And I love this because what, what God is showing Elijah is that when you are in the midst of trouble, you might think that God is coming down on you, but actually God is getting close to you when you're in trouble. One author put it this way. He said, when someone speaks in a whisper, you have to get very close to hear. In fact, you have to put your ear near the person's mouth. We lean toward a whisper and that's what God wants. The fact that God meets Elijah in his place of trouble 
with a whisper means that God is saying, lean in, I am close to you now. It means that when you're in trouble, God doesn't have it out for you. God's not necessarily angry with you. In fact, God loves you. Not just loves you, God likes you. You know, I'm reminded of uh, what I used to read every Sunday at the church I went to. We were in a church that did not have air conditioning. And so we used these fans, and the fans were usually provided by a funeral home. Um, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so in the fan, they would have like poems or quotes. And, and one of the famous ones that would be in some of these fans is Footprints in the Sand. Have you ever read that poem? The poem is about a man who's looking at his life with God, and he realizes that through most of his life, God has been right there with him in ways that he wasn't even aware of. There have been two footprints. But the man kind of pushes back and he says, but God, I noticed that every time I went through something difficult or hard, there's only one set of footprints there. And the poem goes on to say, if you're familiar with it, God responds to the man and says, my son, when you were in the toughest parts of your life, when you were in trouble, it was then that I carried you. See, every situation in your life, is an invitation to relationship with Jesus. It's an invitation to experience his trust. And I love that at Elijah's place of trouble, when things feel unsteady, God is steady with his provision. The second thing is this, when things are unsteady, God is steady with his patience. You know, God meets Elijah at the mouth of the cave in a low whisper, and he leads with a question. God starts the conversation, not with a bold statement, but with a question. First Kings 19.9, it says, there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? I love it. God asks Elijah a question. How do you hear God when he speaks to you? You know, how you hear this question determines the tone of how you might answer it. And I love that God does what every good parent does here. He repeats himself to Elijah. I have three kids. That means 90% of my time with them is spent repeating myself, right? You know what I'm talking about if you're a parent. So in 1 Kings 19, 13, it says, and when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him again and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? This is an interesting question. What are you doing here? It's a question that God asks people all the time in the Bible. He asked this question to Adam and Eve after they eat of the forbidden fruit. God is asking this question not as an indicting question, but actually as an inviting question. He's inviting relationship. God is asking you and I in the midst of trouble, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? I think God is asking that question oftentimes when we're in trouble, not because he wants us to feel like something's happened that we are responsible for, maybe, but I think he's asking it in terms of like, hey, what are we doing here? Where are you finding me in this? How? Am I present in the midst of your trouble? That's what he was asking Elijah in the cave. You know, I think that God might be asking some of us similar questions in the midst of our trouble. Maybe God is asking you, what are you doing in transition? Not why are you in transition, but what are you doing while in transition? What are you doing in trauma? Again, not judging you for being in a place where traumatic events are impacting you emotionally, relationally, but saying, hey, what are we doing while in trauma? How can I partner with you to heal in this place in your life? What are you doing in recovery? What are you doing while in recovery? You know, when I was at the bottom after just having fallen, the guy who was leading the, the, the trip, his name's Chris, he, he came to me and he asked me a question that became a refrain that I really feel was God speaking to me through Chris. His question was, hey, Chuck, how's your heart? after he realized I wasn't, you know, terribly hurt. How's your heart? And it was a question that I needed. It was the question that led to me being able to process that next morning. How is my heart? What am I feeling? You know, what I realized is even in the middle of that trouble, God was providing for me. He provided me with the right community of men and young men to stand with me in the midst of what was going to be a very different week. Another thing he provided, though, is he provided my son. My son, Nathan. We, we had a moment about 30 minutes afterwards, I'm still in pain. I'm realizing now my arm is really in pain. And my son, though, when he realized I was basically okay, other than that, came to me and just between me and him, he said, hmm, even the pastor isn't perfect. It really struck me. Because what I realized is my son usually sees me in a position of power. And, and every dad wants that, right? I want my son to think I'm 
in control, you know, not out of control, that I'm not a victim of life. And, and, you know, he sees that. I'm kind of a public figure, and he knows and has been in situations where I've interacted with people who say, hey, this is what your dad's work has meant to my life. I mean, he, he sees that part of me, but, but I think what Nathan needed that week, and honestly, probably what I needed too, is to need him. He needed to see me not in a position of power, but in a position of need. Every morning on that trip, my son had to wrap my arm in a plastic bag so that I could take a shower and not have my casket wet. He needed to see that dad needs you sometimes too. And I think I also was provided with an opportunity to be fathered by God. You know, God met me in that trouble. He met my son and I in that trouble. Even as we debriefed and talked about how he experienced that fall, I was able to father him in that moment with the wisdom that God gave me. I'd never been through that before. And he felt like it was his fault. And I was able to have the right words to encourage him. Hey, this is not your fault. This is not about you. It was an accident. And I'm just thankful that God provided even in the midst of that trouble. But that's how God is. God is steady with his provision when things are unsteady. He's also steady with his patience. He will meet you where you are. But here's the final thing, the powerful thing. God says, when things are unsteady, I am steady with my purposes. When things are unsteady, God is steady with his purposes. Elijah is in that cave and he is just like, God, I don't know what to do. I feel like my life is falling apart. And God gives Elijah some much needed perspective. And I hope this is helpful perspective for you and I too. Simply put, God says to Elijah, you are not alone and my plans will not be thwarted. That's what God says to him. And why does he say this? Because he asked Elijah this question, what are you doing here? And you know what? Let me give you a just a very analytical Word for word translation of Elijah's response to God. What Elijah says to God is, hey, I've been jealous for you. I've been doing all these things. I've been the only prophet and the entire nation is against me. I'm the only one left. And I want to give you a translation of what that would have sounded like in our language. Basically what Elijah said to God is nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to eat some worms. Big, fat, juicy ones, long, thin, slimy ones, itsy, bitsy, fuzzy, wuzzy worms. What a strange children's song, by the way. I'm just going to say that. What a strange children's song. But, but Elijah basically felt that way. He was kind of having his own pity party. But you know what God says to him in that moment? God says, my purposes are never thwarted. And he begins to tell Elijah about the plans he's put in place to say, Jezebel, that queen that wanted to kill you, her days are done. Her days are done. I am going to have you usher in a new king, a king that's going to have a different heart toward me. He also says, you're not alone. God says, you think you're alone, but there are 7,000 people who have not bowed down to these false gods. And I feel like in some ways, that's what God did with my trouble this summer. He gave me a different perspective. You know what? Montana was an amazing trip. Nathan and I connected and bonded in powerful ways. My broken arm was not the highlight of the trip. It was a restored and strengthened relationship with my son. It was different than what I expected. But I got a new community of fathers. I got a new connection with my son. I got a new connection as a son of a God who loves me, of a God who meet, meet, meets me and will meet you even in the midst of your trouble. And God did something else too. Because right after the fall, there was a point where fear was entering my heart. And I was thinking about what happened when I was on the bike trip. And I was thinking about now what just happened. And it was like, never again. I will never come out west again. That fear was settling in. And let me tell you what God did. God rescued me from that fear. Because you know what? I have a younger son. I have a son named Samuel. And I felt that fear rising in me that says, never go back. And I feel like God took that place of fear and said, I will not let that have the final word. I will not be defined as the person who always gets injured out West. I'll be defined as the person who takes around personally and relationally out West. And in three years, I will take my son, Sam, on this same trip and I will hike that same trail again. Because when it comes to trouble, the way to better is not escaping it, it's facing it. It's interesting. God tells Elijah the same thing. He tells Elijah to go back. He says, go back. He says, go back and be the prophet that I've called you to be to my people. Go back and face Jezebel and her threats and know that I will protect you from her. Go back and travel down the path of your fearful escape and face your trouble. And I believe that God might be saying that to you and I right now. Where is God asking you to go back? 
Maybe right now God is calling some of you to go back to seeking him and putting him first in your life. Maybe God is saying, go back to that community that helped you live a healthy life. Don't stay in isolation any longer. Go back to the place you've been afraid and let me heal that fear in you. Maybe God is saying, go back to the place of failure and shame so I can write a story of redemption in the very place in your life where you thought things would never change. Go back and make things right by forgiving or asking for forgiveness so I can revive a relationship that you've counted as dead. Go back and finish what you started so that my good purposes and plans for your life can be fulfilled. God is telling some of you to go back because the way back to better isn't escaping trouble, it's facing trouble. Hey, let me tell you, your better is not somewhere different. It's seeing what God does in your trouble right in the midst of the journey he has you on. Your better marriage isn't a different marriage. It's the marriage you're in right now. For some of you, your better job isn't a different one. It's the job you're doing right now. God's word to you is to bloom where you're planted and recognize that trouble is just turbulence and God has you in his hands. I love Isaiah 26.3. It says, you will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. God wants to give you something that you absolutely need in the midst of trouble. He wants to give you a greater trust. He wants you to be able to have the confidence in him that even when things are unsteady, you trust his steady provision. You trust his steady presence and patience. You trust that his purposes will not fail for you. So I wanna give you a tool. I want to give you a tool because you know what? When I'm on that plane, like I said, I'm still getting used to the turbulence thing. I, I like to be able to hold on to that armrest. I'm just going to be honest. I know it makes no difference at all in the final outcome, but it makes me feel better in that situation. And I think God wants us to have spiritual tools that operate like spiritual armrests, things that we can lean on when we're going through a difficult time. One of them is a prayer, and I want you to pray this prayer with me. You know, maybe this message really resonates with where you are and, and doing something physical in this moment as a sign that, hey, God, I'm gonna trust you is a powerful way to you, for you to respond. If that's you, then I just want you to hold your hands out like this. Just a universal sign of surrender. And I want you to actually say this prayer out loud with me now. Maybe you're in a place where you can do that. Maybe you're in a place where you can't do that. Hey, if you're driving, you do not have to have your hands out like this. Keep them at three and nine. It's all good. It's all good. Your heart can have a posture of surrender. But if you can, I want you to pray this prayer with me out loud. It's called the Prayer of Relinquishment. It's by Richard Foster. And this might be a tool you can use, not just in this moment, but in several moments to come when you're in a place of trouble. Let's pray this together. Today, O oh Lord, I yield myself to you. May your will be my delight today. May your way have perfect sway in me. May your love be the pattern of my living. I surrender to you my hopes, my dreams, my ambitions. Do with them what you will, when you will, as you will. I place into your loving care my family, my friends, my future. Care for them with a care that I can never give. I release into your hands my need to control, my craving for status, my fear of obscurity. Eradicate the evil, purify the good, and establish your kingdom on earth. For Jesus' sake, amen. Man, I hope that you found peace in knowing that God is steady in his provisions, his patience, and with his purposes. And I actually have two clear ways for you to put what we learned today into immediate action. The first is through worship. It's just responding to God with a song called When You Move. You can find the video right next to this one on crossroads.net and in the app, or if you're on YouTube, the link is in the description. The second is The Journey. It's coming September 25th. And the three things you need to do it are a book, this one, a group, and the app. Signups to join groups are now open. If you want to host or join, you can go to crossroads.net slash online journey to find your group right now. The app is available wherever you get your apps. It's completely free. It's called the Crossroads Anywhere app. And in addition to the journey content, it has amazing daily content, Bible reading, community prayer, and a bunch of other things. You can download it again wherever you get your apps. And don't forget to hit subscribe or watch this video right now. The best way to watch Crossroads Church is on your smart TV because that's where your family hangs out. And plus, 
taking a break from your phone and tablet feels good. Download the Crossroads TV app on your smart TV and your TV becomes a place to hear from God, a window into life change, a spiritual rhythm, your I finally went to church this week. Set a time to experience church on your TV. See, you've already made your TV smarter. Download the Crossroads TV app. It'll give you the boost you and your family need for your week.